Environmental priorities for global sustainable development is a topic that deserves close attention. We will now talk about sustainable project development and the impact investments in energy. Discussions about the future of affordable, affordable and clean energy, we use the term the green square. This is the energy from the wind, sun, water and atom. The right energy balance is access to food, education, work. It's the energy supply for all existing innovations. From electric vehicles that need energy storage to quantum computers whose power depends on the power of the energy source. And while scientists try to crack thermonuclear fusion, which could cover all of the planet's energy needs. Let's discuss how business investments could accelerate our progress in other types of energy. We would like to thank the speakers for a fascinating discussion. Our next speaker is going to present the EDF's view of the current global challenges and how these challenges are examined and dealt with. Innovation in traditional lines of business and the future energy mix will be discussed in more detail by the Chairman and CEO of EDF, Jean Bernard Levy. It is my great pleasure to participate in this Global Impact Conference. I am really honored to share with you some of, of my personal convictions about this session, Energy for All. I would like to start by reviewing some of the lessons learned from the coronavirus crisis, which has never been as serious as it is now on a global scale. We are facing an unprecedented crisis which will impact not only the economies of the countries in which we operate, but also within our own company. And at EDF, we are doubling our efforts day after day. We should also learn lessons from the new working methods we have adopted these recent weeks, giving our workforce greater autonomy and empowerment. Many voices indeed are calling for transformation, but we will not achieve it by using the model of the past. We need to ask ourselves, what will tomorrow's world look like? First and foremost, I am convinced that we are heading towards a world of greater solidarity. We will view our needs, our emergencies, our priorities in a different light. We will speak differently about progress and prosperity. These changes will place public utilities, and more specifically, our own EDF, at the heart of the social model in the countries where we operate. And we are ready to help build a new model that will place those without all the advantages in a better position. Secondly, I'm convinced that society will be more outspoken in its demands for forceful action against climate disruption and against the extinction of biodiversity. Obviously, no clear link has been established between environmental disruptions and the COVID-19 epidemic. But experts' opinions, while diverging us on this issue, lead us to believe that the frequency at which the disease has spread among different species is linked to changes in land occupancy and to pressure on biodiversity. We know that climate change will result in losses of water and agricultural resources, in human migrations and in serious impacts on biodiversity. This should prompt a more aggressive approach to the fight against climate change, and probably at this stage we have underestimated the effects of climate change. Ever since the Industrial Revolution, social development has largely relied on the use of fossil fuel energy sources, which are not renewable, and they do emit greenhouse gases. In today's world, 81% of the energy that we consume come from fossil resources. Within just a few decades, the situation has reached a point if, where if we do not act. Global warming will reach well above 1.5 degrees just for the 20 years from 2030 to 2050. 
and some scenarios even suggest a five-degree increase by the end of the century. Faced with such a prospect, we can't give up. We cannot resign ourselves to negative growth. But fortunately, as human development also goes in hand with an incredible spurt of innovation, we have the solutions at our hands. The premise lies at the heart of EDF's strategy, CAP 2030 and our raison d'etre, which we have just written into our Articles of Association that was in May 2020. Our raison d'etre is to build a net zero energy future with electricity and innovative solutions and services to help save the planet and drive well-being and economic development. Please know that once integrated into our statutes, as we did in the last spring, this raison d'etre becomes a commitment. Our shareholders can legally sue us if we do not respect such societal commitments. It was important for me to include the raison d'etre, this raison d'etre, in the statutes of EDF, because I fundamentally believe that this is also the role of business to support the shaping of societies in which we live or in which we strive to live. Spurred by this raison d'etre, we at EDF have undertaken to support our residential business and municipal customers on the common journey towards carbon neutrality. So we are offering our clients innovative solutions based on the use of carbon-free electricity, including, as an example, electric mobility. And uh, we are on the way to reaching our ambition to become France's leading energy supplier for EVs by 2022. Climate targets are within our reach. In France, we already have a low-carbon electricity mix thanks to the nuclear and renewables, including hydro, solar and wind power energy resources that we have built and that we operate. And I could say the same with the United Kingdom, which is our second largest country where EDF operates. Such highly decarbonized countries will now speed up the transition of fossil fuel usage towards electricity, especially for mobility and for heating. In countries that, unfortunately for them, still have a high carbon electricity mix, and we know of a very large and wealthy country that have a very high carbon electricity mix next door to France. We at EDF, we intend to support the energy transition by offering low carbon solutions and innovative services. We are bringing our expertise as a low carbon energy provider to new regions of growth and innovation. A good example is developing the hydro sector, and I can uh, give an example far away from, from Europe. Uh, after uh, several years, we built in Laos uh, the Namton project, which uh, delivers a huge proportion of the needs both of Laos and of neighboring Thailand. This uh, hydro dam is operating very well under the auspices of the World Bank. We are following similar solution in um, difficult uh, to access uh, areas, like in Cameroon, where we are being a 420 megawatt dam, still with the support of the World Bank, in order to bring to Cameroon all of a sudden 30% more electricity. And this, hopefully, will be done in three years' time. In such countries, huge projects like this are national priorities. The reliability of the power system that we can also bring to our huge experience as uh, the uh, operator of such a large low carbon system as France's will, of course, bring a lot of credibility to those solutions that we provide to our client. In each and every project that we prepare, that we build, that we operate all around the world, we want to pay particular heed to environmental and social aspects. We also want to take measures to ensure that all populations will benefit from them. As an example, the Nartigal project in Cameroon employs today more than 1,800 Cameroonians, 
a local employment, employment plan has been established to staff the company when we move into operations after the construction phase, and that will be, as I said, um, in 23, end of 23, early 2024. I would now like to spend a few minutes talking about another important topic, which is biodiversity. And I'm personally convinced that there should be no competition between supporting either biodiversity or climate change. I think biodiversity is deeply relevant to climate change and that it is, hence, deeply relevant to EDF Group. Our sites are in areas, close to areas, which are very rich in biodiversity, with all types of ecosystems. That can be estuaries, it can be marine, it can be land, it can be fresh waters. Biodiversity does keep us quite busy at EDF. We are lucky to have a nuclear production mix. Its energy density in nuclear considerably limits the artificialization of the land, which, as one knows, is one of the five major concerns for biodiversity. So nuclear also does tick positively that box of biodiversity. Let me give you another example. In 1986, we built our first fish lift in some uh, dam in the Massif Central in the center of France. So we've been uh, concerned with the uh, biodiversity issues for now 40 years. We are totally committed to implement a positive approach to biodiversity. We can do better when uh, we build, when we operate. We can do better. We can avoid irreversible damages to nature. And we just will not limit ourselves to a defensive approach by only focusing on reducing the impact on what our industrial activities may have on the ecosystems. Another example that is close to my heart in the Alps, we built a hydro plant on the Romanche River, and uh, that was uh, inaugurated by myself a couple of months ago. We've replaced five facilities with only one 10 kilometer fully underground gallery. So we've given the river its natural riverbed back, back to the biodiversity before we had built the previous dams. And while we have at the same time, uh, improved the capacity of the system, but by building it totally inside the uh, mountains, totally underground. We have chosen to replant native plant species in those areas which we have freed from human activity. And of course, these uh, will be more robust than anything else we could have done. In the past few months, especially with uh, lockdown and uh, management of the virus. I think society has highlighted the crucial role of electricity in ensuring that we remain in touch with our loved ones, that we continue to engage as much as possible in social activities, in our professional lives, and naturally that uh, with electricity we can still receive medical treatment. I'm sure that the following month will further highlight electricity's vital role in helping to drive well-being and economic development and to save the planet. Thank you. Thank you for joining me at the Global Impact Conference. All of our speakers are in complete agreement on the important role that energy and innovation play in creating equal opportunities in order to provide reliable and clean energy to people around the world. Our next speaker, Kirill Komarov, first Deputy General Director for Development and International Business of Rosatom, will elaborate on his vision of the prospects of the energy sector and the role corporations play in building a sustainable future. Dear ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon from our part of the world. Energy is life. People argue about everything, but there is no debate whether prosperity depends on energy. Energy is vital need today because there are still 700 million people who still live in the dark age. Energy boosts economic development. It creates new industries, jobs, sciences, technologies, and effects on the quality of life in general. The COVID pandemic affirms another time that an energy source should be reliable. 
It should be stable and accessible 24 hours, seven days a week. The stability of electricity supply is vital for us as hospitals, transportation, city infrastructure are fully dependent on energy. As a global community, we should treat the environment responsibly. The most sustainable option should always be your first choice. We cannot afford success at any cost. Therefore, we believe that the sustainable development is impossible without clean and reliable energy. Nuclear power is the only energy source ticking all the boxes. It is efficient, reliable, and clean. A single uranium fuel pellet produces as much energy as 400 kilos of coal. Nuclear power plant emits little to zero CO2. Each year, Russian-designed nuclear power plants alone prevent as much CO2 emissions worldwide as forests of triple Germany's could absorb. In Rosatom, we are honored to make our contribution to the production of clean and reliable energy. Rosatom is a global nuclear leader trusted by over 50 countries around the world. We have launched the first nuclear power plant on the planet in the mid of the 20th century. Today, we have the world's largest portfolio of foreign orders with 35 power units in a dozen of countries. We have the biggest share of the uranium enrichment market, and every sixth reactor in the world runs on our fuel. We have the only industrial fast reactor and nuclear ice-breaking fleet. We are the only company to offer energy solutions across the nuclear supply chain. Rosatom is really a big corporation, and we understand our responsibility for the sustainable performance. Together with nuclear energy, we also develop other low-carbon power generation fields, including wind power. This year, we have launched our first 150 megawatt wind farm in Russia's south. The construction of the second, even more powerful project is already underway. Overall, we have plans for one gigawatt of wind power in Russia in coming years, and we plan to supply our wind power solutions to overseas markets. Talking about low-carbon energy, it seems that hydrogen has become the hostest new thing on the energy market. Rosatom has been producing it for internal needs for decades. We believe that our hydrogen will find its proper place in the future energy mix. Through the 75 years of its history, Rosatom has acquired substantial skills and capabilities for far outside the power sector. Today, we have over 80 products in our portfolio, and all of them somehow support the implementation of the global sustainable development agenda. We have such solutions as nuclear medicine, sterilization for agricultural needs, environmental projects, smart city digitalization campaign, supercomputers, lasers, additive technologies, and so on. We are diversifying our portfolio to obtain 40% of revenue from non-nuclear power products by 2030. Our main priority is to manufacture goods and provide services which improve the quality of life for everyone. And we are committed to do it with the utmost respect for the environment and natural resources. We believe that Rosatom, as a global company, is responsible for its global impact. We see contribution to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as an essential precondition for any business decision. We call on companies that share our values to join us in making the world a better place. We believe in the power of cooperation, and we are open to international dialogue. Thank you. Our energizing panel starts off with the co-founder and managing director of Heed Capital, president of the Global Technology Symposium, and one of the 20 most influential women in finance in the Bay Area, venture capitalist Alexandra Johnson. Alexandra's guest in our online fireside chat is a pioneer of impact investment and the founder of managing partner of the DBL, Double Bottom Line Partners Fund, Ira Aaron Priest. This is a person who has been changing the world for decades through their investments in business with purpose and the organization of significant events where industry leaders join forces to create a future together. The World Energy Innovation Forum is one such event. He is also an early investor in Tesla Motors and Solar City. Please welcome Ira Aaron Priest and Alexandra Johnson. Hi, Ira. It's so nice to see you. Obviously, you and I have known each other years, and uh, I've been a witness of your tremendous success in the venture capital industry, not just in Silicon Valley, but I would say globally. 
but our audience probably does not know you as well as I do. They don't know that um, you've been nominated as the leading of the National Venture Capital Association. They do not know the current president of the Western Association of Venture Capital. They do not know that you are co-chair of VC Network, my favorite venture capital community. They probably do not know that you are a founder of GBL. So I can talk about you forever, but we have a limited time. So I would let you introduce yourself and your fund to our audience. Welcome, Ira. Thanks, Sasha. Well, first of all, it's great to be with you and, and the audience. Anytime I can spend time with you, Sasha, is a treat for me. Uh, and I just wanted to thank you for your friendship and for your leadership over so many years. Uh, great to be with you here today. Uh, so as you referenced, DBL uh, Partners, which is our venture firm, stands for Double Bottom Line. It's actually considered one of the pioneering firms in the venture asset class in impact investing. In fact, we started investing in this area before the term and the moniker impact investing was even used. And we have a little over a billion dollars under management. We invest in a wide variety of sectors. We're committed to a focus on diversity. And it's all about this, this thesis, this ethos, that there's, not, there's no longer a trade-off between doing well and doing good. And it's technology and innovation and great entrepreneurship that has made it possible. Uh, in fact, it's an imperative to have a positive impact in the world and make money, not just one or the other. I have to say that I've heard that word combination impact investment from you, Ira. <laughs> and uh, you've been a champion and a pioneer in that field, I would say, in the whole country. Uh, even when we're discussing strategies of uh, and current trends of venture capital, you can say, no, 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 you need to really pay attention to the particular essence of it. So now, I would say these word combination is everywhere. You talk to an investor anywhere in the world and they say, yeah, impact investment, impact investment. But what is it and why is it, first of all, why did it become so popular right now? And why, it, from your perspective, is the best time to be a, uh, an impact investor? Why now? Well, you're you're absolutely right. Uh, when we started doing this, people did question it. It was uh, people thought of it as zero sum. They thought of it as this paradigm of trade off. They thought it was concessionary. And we've always believed that this is all about the integration of first and second bottom line. It's about building the best possible companies. And there's a number of reasons for that. Um, but as you as you think about the timing and how and this journey about where we've come, and you're right, now is a moment in time where we're seeing impact investing and the ESG mindset permeating across the, the capital markets. And, you know, from my perspective, there's really been uh, this, there's really been two uh, very important uh, drivers of that in the venture industry, as much as uh, the venture capitalists have their, their thesis on where they invest and, and, and we talk about what the VCs do, what it really comes down to is the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur is ultimately the driver of what we see in these trends. Uh, and and in, in, in this case as well, uh, we're now seeing this incredible moment in time where the very best entrepreneurs want to be part of an impact investing movement. They are purpose-driven. They are mission-oriented uh, innovators. They are unapologetic about not wanting this idea of compromise and scaling a large financial enterprise but doing so while, uh, while changing the world in the process, having some second bottom line mission orientation. And so part of the reason for this extraordinary uh, uh, movement, and it's really gone from marginal to mainstream in many ways, or at least approaching mainstream, is, is ultimately the, the entrepreneurs. The, some of the greatest entrepreneurs of our time uh, are focused on, on this idea of impact investing. And we've seen this across the venture asset class. It, of course, permeates our portfolio. Um, and, and so that's one important dimension of it. The second I'd mention around just the human capital side is this focus on diversity. We have historically had a lot of things to be proud of in the venture asset class uh, on so many levels. But one of those, uh, one thing that we shouldn't be proud of as an industry historically 
is the diversity dimension to entrepreneurship and venture capital. And we are now seeing, of course, what we've, we've long been saying, which is diversity is not nice to have. It's about making our companies better. It's about making our teams more effective. It's about making better decisions. And we're beginning to see uh, the unlocking. And of course, this is what DBL focuses on, is the idea of attracting and hiring and opening the aperture of entrepreneurship across a much wider field than we've ever had. And that's a, a, an extremely important catalyst for innovation in places and in people and in sectors that we haven't had before. Beyond talent, hmm. what we've also seen that reflects this incredible moment in time is the influx of capital. And when, when we hearken back to when we started doing this, uh, and I described it as marginal. It, it was marginal also in the sense of that there wasn't very many, there weren't very many dollars flowing into what we all described as impact investing. Uh, they were smaller funds. Mm -hmm. And now as we have, you know, fast forward here, just in the last few years, we've seen an unprecedented commitment to this approach. We see uh, the largest asset manager, we see BlackRock making uh, quite a vocal and public yeah. commitment to impact. We see big private equity firms like Bain and TPG. We see big banks like JP Morgan and Goldman and Morgan Stanley and so many others making commitments to impact in recent years. And the idea of this combination between entrepreneurial talent and extraordinary uh, amounts of capital combined are leading again to this unprecedented time to be an impact investor, to be an impact uh, entrepreneur and to be part of the impact movement. Yeah, when you put it in those terms, a combination of this talent and the capital that is flowing into now, and I know, yes, in BlackRock and Gates Foundation, millions of Bill Gates Foundation and the Rockefeller, right? If you look at what money is going in, but again, looking back, uh, as a privilege to have known you for such a long time. <laughs> I know that when you picked sustainability and energy as the sectors for your focus, that was highly unusual, should I say that. But if you look at the, at the, at the time, at the time now, now everyone, everybody wants to do that, but you are ahead of the curve because you also invested in those two companies. I mean, you invested more than in two companies, but the companies that are famous for being companies would be, of course, Tesla and Solar City. How did you decide back then that that's what you need to support? Because the support for Solar City back then, I remember that well, was not that big. <laughs> and Tesla. Tell us what you can yeah. I know that you can have. They tell us everything, but you've been a board member of Tesla, right? One of the first board members. Tell us what you can, please. <laughs> well, you know, the, the journey into energy technology, energy innovation, clean technology, sustainability um, was motivated by a number of factors. But at its core, one of the important dimensions of venture capital is actually, as you describe it, being ahead of the curve, but also understanding where there are underserved areas that haven't been tackled before. And one of the paradoxes or the ironies uh, in those early years as we were reflecting on where the venture asset class was deploying dollars was the idea that there was a, just, there, there were a very small number of concentrated sectors that were getting this capital, but it left out a, a large number of sectors globally that weren't actually as, as weren't beneficiaries of entrepreneurship and venture capital. And energy was really at the core of that thesis. Uh, it was a desert of innovation. There had been historically uh, a, a set of incumbents that hadn't focused on the kind of innovation and, and R&D and investment dollars that the typical IT and life science sectors historically had. And yet, it was against the backdrop of some really important dimensions that in our view uh, led to this area being an incredibly exciting place to invest. And you know, when we think of this, it really does fit the DBL ethos of green without sacrifice. It's combining the green of financial returns with the greening of the environment. That was the initial premise and we set out to do so. And when we think of why, uh, it starts with, of course, the market. Uh, the market sizing, uh, the energy markets among the largest markets in the world, not measured in the billions, but measured in the trillions, the growth of this sector, 
uh, of course, also an exciting dimension. And if we then overlay that onto what's happened, not just in the broad sector, but in the renewable sector, we've seen you know, that, that we have almost three quarters now of all new energy capacity coming online over this past year uh, as being in the renewable sector. And yet in the develop, developing world, as an example, we take for granted the lights atop our head as we have this conversation, but the developing world lacks access to a grid or at least a stable grid. And that's led to our view that there's real opportunities uh, in the developing world as well. And so that's been an important dimension of it. The second uh, aspect to our excitement has been this truly unprecedented rate of innovation. When we got started in the years you referenced when we started investing in the sector, uh, solar had a certain cost. And just in this last decade, the cost curve as a result of innovation and scale has plummeted. There's been a reduction of about 90% of cost taken out of, of solar just in the past decade and high 90% reduction over the past several decades. Wind has followed a similar path uh, with a, a significant reduction in the last decade, almost about 70%. We've seen LEDs go from $50 a lumen to a penny a lumen just since uh, the year 2000. We've seen lithium ion batteries uh, falling almost 90% in cost. And we've seen an unprecedented number of, of innovations and innovators focused on the sector. The third dimension that's exciting for us is the public policy pull around this sector. And while in recent years, when people talk about this, at least in the US, they talk about the federal policy, and we're of course hopeful that in the next administration, we will see uh, perhaps a, uh, an, an increased commitment. We've just seen a number of, uh, of, of recent announcements that give us a lot of hope that uh, the $2 trillion climate plan, no, plan but, would be the most- but, plan. Right, when it's brought into, mm -hmm. yeah, with this whole, whole cabinet seat will be devoted to it. That's major. Absolutely. Senator Kerry recently announced as the new administration climate czar. So, so many exciting, hopeful uh, announcements coming up on the federal side, but you know, government plays a role at all levels. And what I think people have missed when they, when they ignore, uh, or they simply focused on US federal policy is that in the US state governments, particularly California have filled uh, the federal leadership void in recent years with uh, the California cap and trade model and the RPS. Uh, and beyond California, so many states uh, focused on renewable portfolio standards. And then globally, uh, with so many countries actually being important leaders on their policy initiatives. And then finally, I'll just mention the, the, uh, the last aspect, which has driven our excitement in this sector historically, has been the evolution of big corporates. The corporates in those early days when we started were largely greenwashing. This was a PR initiative more than anything else. And if you fast forward to today, uh, it's just been unbelievable in terms of the commitment we've seen from large corporations, understanding that it's not just uh, good for the planet, but it's good for their business, it's good for their customers. And, uh, and we have corporates signing on to you know, 50 gigawatts of clean energy power purchase agreements. We have the renewable energy, the RE100, where we have almost 300 companies pledging to go 100% renewable as part of that RE100 campaign. We have Google you know, going one step further to pledging 24 seven carbon free energy by 2030 and even companies like Delta and BP vowing to go carbon neutral. So these are all of the drivers to an incredibly exciting time. And when we think about the where we are today, yes, we've been doing this for several decades, but we actually think we're just in the first chapter of a, a several decade overhaul of a 20th century carbon focused set of industries to uh, an overhaul of our 21st century ecosystem. And that provides huge opportunity for entrepreneurs, for innovation and for venture capital. Yeah, you've been a, a lead investor in the US in the sustainability and energy as I've said many times today and I'm happy to together but i also know you're aware of what's happening globally and it looks like there will be speakers after our session and there will be a representative of the french minister of energy um CLV, and i'm sure you know the as an organization and uh, they've been uh, 
they've been a leader in the in that particular field in the world also for quite some time and then there is a, a corporation in Rosado that has a multi multiple industries they work with in that sector would you comment at you would you comment in the US corporations now getting on board yeah absolutely not just checking a box but they actually mean it now. Can you comment on what's happening globally? I, do you know anything about what's happening sure. in France, for example? Sure. Well, you're, you're a thousand percent correct. And there have been so many uh, wonderful examples of both corporations and leadership in those corporations globally that are in fact leading the charge. And you know, you mentioned France. Um, EDF, as an example, has been a great partner of DBL as one of many, many, many corporates globally uh, that see what we see, that this is uh, about how we actually build a bridge uh, for the next generation of energy uh, infrastructure in a sustainable way. And those leaders like EDF and, and, and so many others uh, are viewing DBL and firms like ours as a partner in that initiative. And you know, venture capital historically uh, has built in the traditional sectors of IT and life sciences some extraordinary uh, small company, big company partnerships. And what, what's really exciting in the world of energy is those companies are larger, uh, they have big resources, uh, and, and companies that we historically thought, uh, uh, based on a historic incumbency and set of initiatives, are now having real live commitments, both in uh, venture capital, uh, it, some internal programs, some investing in funds like DBL, uh, in creating business development opportunities. So you're 100% right. This is all about how we bring to bear a global industry with a global set of partners, with a global set of innovation. You know, it's still mind boggling that um, Tesla is what, 500 billion now, something like that, market cap. But when you started as one of the first investors in Tesla, what was the valuation of Tesla at the beginning when you first met them? Well, Do you remember? It, it's, it, is definitely, it has definitely been uh, an, an incredible journey. Let, let me just, can I just say one thing, Sasha, just before leaving the sustainability topic, because I think there's a really important dimension that I want to make sure we cover uh, for the audience, because oftentimes uh, the other aspect of this journey that I, that I think is bears mention, in those early days you talked about, it was a, not only a small number of entrepreneurs and a small number of, of venture investors, but it was actually a relatively concentrated set of sectors that were focused on energy and sustainability. And we actually, at DBL, what we're trying to show is this broader thesis of impact and how impact can live and breathe across so many dimensions. And of course, solar, and of course, batteries and storage. And of course, EVs have been important dimensions of the practice. But what we're really excited about is being able to show the world that the broader idea of impact can live and breathe in a number of sectors, a number of sectors like that have similar characteristics of uh, the energy and sustainability sector and have entrepreneurship that is similarly unfolding. And I, I think it's important to mention, you know, a, a sector like the food and ag sector, which, you know, the way you described yes. our investing in energy could very well have been said exactly about the food and ag sector, ignored by the venture asset class 20 years ago. Today, a beginning of a movement around entrepreneurship in this area. And as we think about how we're going to feed, go from feeding 7 to 10 billion people on our planet, do so in a more sustainable way. This, again, unlocks a great opportunity. Uh, we were early investors, not just in Tesla that you mentioned, uh, but Farmers Business Network, which is uh, like, uh, which is completely democratizing access for the small farmer around decision making in ways for centuries uh, we haven't had before, or a company like Appeal that we're investors in that is tackling food waste. The idea of taking taking the forty percent waste from farm to fork, and therefore there's zero utility in all of the energy and water and carbon and all the resources that get used. Uh, we need to do we need to do more with less. And so companies like that are seeing a real uh, uh, movement today, much like those core initial ones. We're also seeing it in the circular economy. Uh, again, the idea of second life is is seeing innovation as we've never had before. Uh, fashion, uh, which represents 
you know, 10% of all CO2 emissions, and yet only less than 1% of all clothes are recycled. That's catalyzed opportunities for companies like The Real Real. Or conservation, an area that is so important to the energy movement, but we haven't had for profits focused on conservation. All the so many of the great names in conservation uh, have done uh, so much for the industry, but they're nonprofits, and so we have been focused on finding for-profit initiatives around conservation. And then, finally, I'll just quickly mention because impact lives and breathes in so many areas. As I said, we're seeing an unprecedented set of entrepreneurship in what we call the space Earth nexus. Space expo exploration was traditionally seen as the work of both of either governments or the oligopoly that is focused on it, much like the characteristics of these other industries. And it's so ripe for innovation. And we've seen recent entrepreneurship, of course, led by SpaceX, but others too, driving down costs, taking the kind of innovation we see in IT and other sectors, applying it to space. Uh, we have uh, planet uh, SpaceX not only reducing costs per pound to get into space, but also unlocking the idea of democratizing access to the internet. Over half the world's population doesn't have what we take for granted in doing a, 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 a conversation like this using the internet. Uh, and we need to fix that. We're, it's, we need to find ways from an economic development standpoint to create energy, as I mentioned before, and internet as, as SpaceX is doing to really tackle the three and a half billion uh, in our, on our planet that need that. And Planet Labs, which you know well. Planet is, for the first time in human history, uh, taking a daily image of planet Earth. And we're able to focus on identifying and mapping everything from monitoring deforestation to food scarcity and so many other dimensions of getting a window into planet Earth as we've never had before. And so I just want to say that there's so many opportunities for this broader area of finding companies that were built on a 20th century carbon backbone who themselves did not have innovation historically applied to it and where there's incumbents and, and where innovation can disrupt in hugely impactful ways. And there's so many sectors that represent what we think of as the broader impact opportunity. It goes back to your earlier point that we talked about of why we're so excited and why we think this is a renaissance time to be an impact investor. But actually, that was my question I was going to ask you, but you answered it because uh, when I look at uh, the trajectory of your investment path, when you picked energy, when it was not popular, moved on mm -hmm. and introduced impact to other industries, uh, that was my question. Like, what, what sectors, what other sectors do you invest in and what, uh, yeah. what, what, what opportunities you see? And it's really amazing because I know that FTEC that's agriculture in California, that has been in the development for a while now, right? Because we right. have UC Davis, which is really specializing uh, on uh, uh, in, in that sector. And uh, it, it's it beyond just recycling uh, waste management. No, it's just changing the paradigm of how uh, farmers, smaller, bigger farmers work with the crop. And then uh, when uh, you sell like the fashion industry, absolutely. You know, when you think yeah. about stuff we wear, how it's produced and how much waste is there. Amazing. Education, right? I know that it right. sounds not intuitive, but absolutely we need to change that. And now that you brought up space, yes, <laughs> that is something. So, so you, if you, I mean, you being an investor, an entrepreneur, make a difference, I just, I think they should take your playbook from the energy <laughs> How to do that and apply it to any industry because the approach would be similar. Now, um, what would be your recommendation to aspiring entrepreneurs if they are deciding uh, what industry they can have the most impact in? Like, well, just tell us where you well, invest I next. Yeah, well, look, I, I, the, the nice thing about each of the areas that we, we've just talked about is unlike uh, so many sectors within venture capital that have had decades of innovation, decades of entrepreneurship, decades of capital, uh, these are areas that are in their infancy uh, in terms of how long we've seen this type of uh, entrepreneurship on the one hand, 
And yet some of the largest markets in the world, some of the biggest opportunities and some of the historically least innovative industries. And if you combine all those dimensions, yes, it's true. We've been early and pioneering and successful investors in a number of these sectors. But again, we look at this as just the beginning of, of many, many, many decades of, of opportunities in these sectors. And you know what's probably most exciting about being a venture capitalist is, of course, we have our, our commitment, our focus, our, uh, our historic uh, networks in, in areas and industries like these. I, I'm always amazed at the creativity uh, at, of, of entrepreneurs who will walk into our office every week with new ideas, things that maybe we haven't thought of. And one of the exciting things for me in waking up every day is there are just smarter, more creative, more innovative people and ideas that we are fortunate enough to get exposed to. And uh, I have no doubt that the areas that I mentioned are just uh, among uh, a, a much larger subset of areas that we're, we're likely to invest in over time. And of course, our portfolio is filled with companies beyond these sectors that, uh, that fit the, the overall trifecta uh, framework that I just described. Yep. But as an investor, I also um, know, as I know, that exits are important. And yes, the talented entrepreneurs brought the companies, you invested in them. And then what happens next? They either need to do an IPO or they need to be acquired. So the question is, well, are there enough companies in the world of, with, with the support that movement which started with entrepreneurship, and then at some point it needs to get on a bigger and broader scale. So what do you think, are state-run big companies capable of understanding how um, the, the entrepreneurial world works and not killing that innovative spirit, but lifting it a level? How do your companies work uh, with big, big monopolies? How do they? Yeah. That is a terrific question. And in fact, uh, it, it is the Darwinian, the fundamental Darwinian question of innovation uh, as, as we see, uh, you know, history unfold. And those companies that actually haven't gotten stuck in a rearview mirror historically and have been able to adapt and be flexible like a young company have succeeded. And yet there are those large companies that we historically thought of as the stalwart incumbents uh, decades ago that no longer exist. In fact, if you looked at, uh, at some of the largest market caps uh, right now, uh, uh, trading on the public exchanges, these are companies that didn't exist decades ago. And so, uh, you know, that, that at least shows today the pace of innovation for this. And as you point out, the importance that large companies do innovate, do uh, find ways to, to move forward. It's been one of the things that I, I, I've actually been so proud of uh, about the Tesla team is that as the company has yeah. grown on some level, it's never lost that incredible entrepreneurial, flexible, nimble, but nonetheless focused mindset that defined it in the early days. And if you look at the companies, uh, you know, that continue to actually have a growth rate, even as they have large market caps and large numbers, the large companies that have been successful have been ones that have been able to combine the benefit of scale with those early benefits of what a, a, a successful entrepreneurial mindset is defined by. Yeah, uh, I'll be curious to uh, listen to some of the speakers at this event later, because as I said earlier, there will be a representative of the Ministry of Energy, Sylvie uh, from France and then Rosado, and they are representing big, <laughs> big, big, big players. And uh, I think it's really important in this ecosystem, the spirit remains and uh, they need to learn how to work with the companies that you create. And as you said, your companies need to be aware of what the world is. Now, uh, what, what is an XBL? You guys uh, have been on the forefront of everything when it comes to impact. And uh, But what now? You just forget the word impact because it will become a norm what will be the word that will make you um, because impact is the norm now <laughs> well that that is uh, an aspiration in some ways you know what we're trying to do is is really uh show the world that some of the early successes that we have had aren't just possible but they're necessary 
to create the economy of the future. And using some of these early examples uh, and, and being inspired by some of the early global transformations that we've seen, uh, catalyzing and bringing that same zero sacrifice transformation and mindset to a much broader array of sectors that are in need of innovation and sustainable, sustainable innovation. And what we are continuing to do is we're making big bets in sustainability and in the broader areas of impact where we can continue to show this idea that those companies and those entrepreneurs who truly commit themselves to a social and financial impact are, are poised to unlock the kind of transformational change. Uh, and we've again, we've begun to see evidence of that, uh, not only in our portfolio and in the venture asset class, but I think uh, this last year, nine of the 10 largest ESG funds outperformed the S&P 500 that in the first half of 2020. Good evidence of this idea that we're just building better companies. And you know, you, 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 you reference the aspiration and, and it is the aspiration of showing that double bottom line investing uh, is really the not only the right way that, to invest, the smarter way to invest, but the more profitable way to invest. And uh, if, if we continue to see the quality and quantity of entrepreneurs, I have no doubt that the capital flows will continue to follow. We're seeing more interest now from the limited partner community, uh, those those uh, the community that invests in funds like ours uh, that we we ever had before. I think we're beginning to see the institutional awareness of this, as I said. And ultimately, uh, the real hope is that impact investing just becomes investing and that the idea of integrating a sustainability and a broader ESG mindset and framework into how we fund and build and, and create our companies uh, takes on this double bottom line approach and we build the iconic names of the 21st century. Yes, and I know you've been so successful uh, because you care, first of all. Second, you have this enormous network. You always know what's happening in the world, and you are not afraid to be a leader. Because uh, when started being this invest in energy a while ago, as I said, when it was not popular, it has nothing to do with checking boxes. You leave, you leave people follow and thank you so much for I want to say for your service <laughs> but for your investments and your service to the community because uh, your leadership and the community is you know well known thank you again for your time uh, I trust it was uh, good for our audience to learn more about you and if they need to find you we know how to do that and any Please. final words of wisdom Stop. Well, I, I want to echo the appreciation, Sasha, and just thank you for uh, for your friendship and leadership again. And of course, uh, for anyone who uh, who's listening, you you know where to find us and DVL, and we're always looking for the next generation of entrepreneurs. So please do reach out. Exactly. Thank That's you. Thank you so much, Ira. It's been a pleasure. Bye. Likewise.